Steph is quite right in one sense, what I'm not talking about overtly is education today, but I'm going to sneak it in and use this as an advert for the work of the BCF on education. Um, when the first call went out, I got quite excited because I just moved to um, Carinium, or as you'll probably better know it as Sirencester, um, and very excited by the sort of landscape. Uh, and one of the things I started looking at, just unfortunately I broke my foot on the second day of living here, um, was using a range of online resources, which included LIDAR, uh, as well as various um, map options, to start exploring the landscape, knowing I wouldn't be able to do much about that for some months. Um, so could you go to the next slide, please? Thanks. So the, the main part about this talk links in with something that I've already been doing um, while I was in Kent, and that was exploring in depth the idea of map as biography. I've taken this up from an earlier work by Baron Harley, um, who spoke about map as biography in terms of a particular map of his own. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and recently I produced um, a short paper called Map as Biography, which was published in the IGC special issue, um, edited by Bill Cartwright and others. Um, so that was quite fun. So that's one of the reasons I'm coming into this is through this idea of map as biography, but also how we might use that to enhance teaching to get children and wider communities interested in cartography and in their landscape. The second thing that's linked in with today's talk is this biography of power by Tom Moore, which is an amazing, very, very dense, very, very thick and heavy, but very readable um, archaeological monograph about a place called Badgenden, which is near to Sirencester and is thought to have been the old capital of the, the local tribe prior to the Roman occupation. Next slide, please. Um, oh, just to say, I've also um, re reviewed that book um, because it's absolutely chock full of interesting imagery and maps for the BCS um, Cartographic Journal. So a map as biography. Um, Harley wrote this some time ago, 1987, and it was in Map Collector. Quite a short piece and not so well known as many of his other works, I think, um, although it has been reproduced elsewhere. Um, and he looks at the map in a number of ways. Two I won't speak about at all, and that's the map as a physical object. So its biography, where it was printed, how it was made, and so on. The second, a link to its makers. And again, often there's not that much information. You know, there are OS records and so on that help you understand that. But I think the things that made it most interesting for me are these ideas of the biography of landscape. So for his own um, Ordnance Survey map, Newton Abbott, where he lived for many years, um, he talks about it in terms of unpacking the history of that particular site. And then finally, what's really interesting, I think, is his idea of Mapper's autobiography, his own biography. Um, he lived there. Um, sadly, his wife and his son were both buried in the church there, uh, and his daughter was married there. Um, so he has this real link to that landscape through the map. So it evokes a biography, his own biography. Next slide, please. Right. So this is where I link it into the Education Committee. Um, what I'm interested in here is sort of at, at perhaps even giving out an invitation at the moment for people to get in touch with me and others, Elaine Watts, for example, come back to that in a moment, um, to uh, engage in our developments around teaching and education. And one of the things we're obviously interested in is making maps and using maps in the wider curriculum. So here, we think the role of the cartographic community and librarians will be very important. So the cartographic community might, for example, start working with teachers, and we'd like to facilitate this, to show how resources like the BGS maps, like OS maps, um, other resources that are online, could be used in teaching, but by pairing up educators with cartographers so that we can get a better understanding. And teachers of, uh, that we've talked already would really value that sort of thing. The next thing, and of course, map librarians, one of the ideas that Elaine's been talking to people about is opening up collections, digitizing maps where that's possible, copyright and so on, um, to help teachers uh, in local schools. Community engagement, the map of is again another idea, you know, out to the wider world of the, the local communities to understand their landscapes. And then finally, the thing that I'm very interested in here, and this comes back to today's talk, is learning through engagement with taskscapes, um, geography, history, nexus particularly. Um, and we've been talking with the Historic Town Trust, Nick Milley and Keith Lilly, for example, um, we've met with them, about working through history and geography uh, and perhaps piloting some sort of project with schools, probably primary schools, um, in Canterbury, where one of their latest maps has been produced. What I want to do now is move on to a case study around this concept of task scapes, what I mentioned there. I'll explain those in a minute. Um, next slide, please, Henry. <clears throat> okay, I think that's dropping off the bottom a little bit there. Um, 
This is uh, an interesting picture by Bruegel, and it's one that Tim Ingold, who popularized the term, or devised the term Tarscape, um, uses to illustrate his concept. And he makes the point here that just as the landscape is an array of related features, so by analogy, the Tarscape is an array of related activities. And I think the key component of his Tarscape idea is that Tarscapes make landscape. So the landscape is congealed Tarscape. And he talks about the way in which people interact with the landscape, make routeways, farm the land, create churches, nurture trees, and so on. So that's the evolving Tarscape, something that's happening all the time. But we tend to see it as a snapshot in time. So a map is a, is a snapshot of landscape, but essentially, you know, is built by Tarscape and any other um, impressions of the landscape, such as this painting. Um, sorry, you can't see that. Oh, I can't see the reference at the moment because I've got the bar open at the bottom. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so one of the things that um, I wrote about in my um, map as biography, um, a sort of homage, if you like, perhaps to Harley, um, was <clears throat> the way in which, particularly in landscapes, we have a whole range of activities that scat, scratch, gouge, and rub their marks into the landscape. So we can see these stories written on the ground. And this is where we're starting to get to the 3D, as you can see here. Um, here we have sort of micro topography, um, if you like. Um, these are droveways that were built up over many, many centuries over the North Downs in Kent. So dropping down towards the wheels. Uh, and you can see this is a fascinating part of the landscape, um, but difficult to envisage sometimes on the ground. Next slide, please. Um, so in my own biography, one of the things I did was engage particularly with, uh, it was one to 25,000 map, if you, if you look at my full title, for the area in which I lived. And my house was almost in the dead center of that particular sheet. Um, this is not, this is obviously a, a different uh, map here, but showing a bit more detail for the same area. And my whole life has been involved around that landscape. My father on first arriving in Britain worked on the estate in that landscape. I've carried out research and teaching in this landscape. You know, even up to taking students up to the crown there in the center of the map <coughs> on the North Downs. So I have a long, interesting sort of personal history and engagement with um, this particular area, which is, if any of you want to know roughly where it is, is why, but near Ashford in Kent. And one of the things I was getting fascinated by was this idea of scarification. And so here, for example, you can see three different levels of scarification. If you go to the next slide, please, we have the quarry, which was probably operational in the 1700s into the 1800s. You have the King Edward Memorial crown, which is gouged into the chalk, although it's now painted gabions rather than bare chalk, um, which was created in 1902, I think, if I get that right, the coronation. Uh, and then finally at the top, those pits that you can see to the east, if you like, of the, uh, of the image are thought to be perhaps the oldest Iron Age iron mines in Britain. It's not been absolutely confirmed, but it's into superficial deposits on the top of the chalk. So you can start to engage, imagine engaging students or schools with this idea of scarification, showing how these marks can really get you to understand the evolution of a landscape. So here we have three very different periods, three very different purposes, two mining uh, and, and one celebratory. We go to the next slide, please. So this brings us to my new home. Uh, as it says at the bottom of the slide, I live about here, so just outside of the city walls or the town walls of uh, Roman Corinium. Um, this is a, an artist's impression. Um, and what I'm interested in now, and as I've lived here, is exploring these, exploring what I call powerscapes. And I take that again from Tom Moore's book, the idea of looking at powerscapes. We'll come back to his powerscape in a little bit. Um, so here we have a nice artist's impression, and you can see where roughly where I live, and then over in the far, um, south, effectively, of this image, um, you can see the uh, arena, the amphitheatre uh, on the other side, just outside the city walls. Next slide, please. Um, but, as we all know, on the ground, it's a very different thing. So trying to explore and understand Roman siren sets is very difficult. There's very little bit above ground. Um, only a very small section of wall still exists, um, not far from where this image was taken. So here, Roman North, the, the, the sorry, Northeast Gate of Roman Corinium, Verulamium Gate, you know, there's nothing there. It's just a terrible road. Um, so how do you engage with this sort of landscape now? Next slide, please. Um, here, you know, a nice plaque on the wall, uh, a nice dry stone Cotswold wall. But again, it really doesn't help you <clears throat> too much because you can't envisage it easily. Next slide, please. 
Um, and there's not much to show below ground, even when you have the opportunity. I chatted with a chap to us, we were digging this hole across London Road, and the archaeologists don't even turn up anymore. It's been so disturbed over the years, uh, despite the fact this is on the line of the Foss Way, one of the famous Roman roads of Britain. Next slide, please. Um, so maps matter. We can perhaps, you know, rise above the landscape a little bit, try and envisage things from a bird's eye view. Um, one of the odd problems is that there isn't a very good Roman roads map available of Siren Sester. So next slide, please. You know, do a bit of DIY. Uh, I didn't actually do this on this map. Uh, it was another map entirely, but a street map of Siren Sester that extended a bit beyond um, the town centre. Um, and I superimposed just with pen all the Roman roads and used that to lead a small um, trip around Siren Sester with a few friends um, in the recent past. So, you know, again, here we're starting to think about how do we engage with that landscape? So you have Ermin Way, Foss Way, and Aikman Street, um, all coming into uh, Roman Siren Sester, which was the second largest Roman town after London in Britain. Next slide, please. And just for a bit of fun, and it's very much inspired by a, a young US cartographer, Sasha Trebetskoya, um, who produced some beautiful maps of Roman Britain and its roads, Italy and Europe as a whole. So please go to his website and check it out. Um, if you just put in Roman roads map, often it comes up quite high anyway, um, or Britain. So this is my take on his maps, a little sort of tube map, if you like, of Carinium. Uh, I live near Tarbarrow at the top there. We'll come to Tarbarrow in a second. And I'm going to take you on a short ramble through Siren Sester to the Bull Ring or the Amphitheatre. Next slide, please. And again, you know, it's difficult. You're on the ground. There's not a lot to see. This is the better of the two tar barrows. Um, there are two on this site. There thought to have been a third, but it's now been totally ploughed away. And you can see here, it's been protected um, from ploughing, but it's in the middle of a big open field. And when you step back even further, it is a very large arable field wheat this year. Um, and again, how do we get to deal with this? What can we use? What sort of ways can we engage students, school children, and you know, local communities with their locality? Next slide, please. And LIDAR seems to be one of the, the possibilities. I'm talking about that today because it was a way of shoehorning in um, 3D. Um, we could talk about the use of historic maps. We can talk about the use of contemporary maps uh, and so on to engage with landscape. But here it gives people a real impression of, you know, the type of landscape we're talking about here. So the two tar barrows circled there um, and the Roman roads and the city wall are sort of indicated on this. So we can start to use something like LIDAR to get people to engage with that sort of 3D feel. And one of the key things about tar barrows is that they may well have been late Iron Age or Roman barrows, round barrows, um, but if they were Iron Age, then the Romans respected them. They saw them as a place of spirituality, perhaps, and around the lower of the two tar barrows, the one you saw earlier, is a big Roman graveyard, and there was a temple complex, they think, having used geophysics. But there's nothing to be seen on ground level. It's all been ploughed away. So the Roman roads and other things don't show up on LIDAR, unfortunately. Although Roman Roads Research Association and others use LIDAR extensively to map out Roman roads. Um, but generally in, in more upland areas, other areas where ploughing has not taken place. Next slide, please. Um, here again, just showing you the difference between DTM and DSM, uh, the one where you've just got the terrain at the top there, where um, the overlying structure, the woodland the buildings and so on have been disappeared. Um, well, I'm going to the technicalities of it, you'll know better about this than I will. Um, but again, you can see how this could then become very useful engaging people with landscape, talking about the Iron Age and Roman period, looking at things like 19th century quarries, which turn up there, you can see that very, very clearly now. Um, although it's lost within the woods to an extent on the bottom image. And then talking about things like the impact of farming, you know, the impact of that on the archaeological record, the fact that we can only use geophysics here if we don't excavate, and to some extent crop and soil marks, um, which will, you know, if you have parching and so on, which will show up underlying structures, like such as ditches or, or foundations. Next slide, please. So, I'm taking the tube now down the Foss Way, um, seven stops down, we get to the Bull Ring. Um, and here is the interpretation board at the Bull Ring, um, entertaining Carinium. Um, nice artist impression there. This is taken on the site. You can see it's uh, uh, one of these sort of all weather um, interpretation boards. And it gives you a good impression. But on the ground, what does it look like? Again, we have this 
the issue of talking people through you know the landscape they're in next slide please and you know on the ground it's pretty impressive it doesn't look so uh, on this image sadly um but when you're there it is a fairly impressive structure but it's all lost the seating and everything is is under uh, cover was excavated at one time so it's a beautiful wildlife spot until they know it as i hope done very um, boldly here um, but it's somewhere that you can start to engage people with uses over time so in terms of a task scape obviously it's first intent was entertainment, although we had massive quarries. Um, so there was a real um, construction task going on um, locally using the, the local quarry uh, next to the amphitheater. It was a place of entertainment. It then became a marketplace. It was used as a fortress, pasture, and the most interesting, perhaps in, in 1200s, um, it was converted to a rabbit warren. Um, and although the interpretation board doesn't mention it, I mean, it is now a new thing. It's a heritage site, it's recreation, it's education, the task they're changed through the centuries. So again, you can start to interpret it um, if you use things like LIDAR. So next slide, please. Oh, that was the slide that, I don't know where that went wrong. That's part of the process of everything crumbling yesterday. Thank you, that's better. Next one. So here we have the Roman amphitheater and you can set it in its current context. So people can really get to grips with the way it's been enclosed by the growing town, modern town. You can see industrial buildings just to the Northeast. You can see the hospital to the northwest, uh, a bit of woodland, which is a recreational area now, but that obscures a lot of the underlying features and so on. But if you look at the bottom image, you know, you can play with the two in educational terms. And the bottom one really does bring to the four, the, the size of the quarry um, to the um, east, if you like, of the amphitheater, the amphitheater itself, and then the quarrying and other activity that Roman, post-Roman, um, that surrounds that whole area. So I think you can start to see how this, with historic maps, with field visits, could be a really exciting way of interpreting this for, well, for anyone, but certainly for, for school children. Um, so next slide, please. Um, where do all roads lead to? Is there other Roman roads here? Does that look like a Roman road? It looks very much like a Roman road in the sense you've got the center of Corinium or Sirencester, uh, to the, 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 the east there. And then there's a long road running out. This is in fact, if you go to the next slide, next slide, please. Oh, next slide. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> this is in fact, um, Sirencester Park. And this was developed with the trees, the rides and so on um, from the early 1700s by old Bathurst working with uh, the famous Alexander Pope. Um, and it is, of course, another elite landscape. What I should have said more about the, the Roman roads, of course, is that clearly they were constructed for military uses and then for civilian uses for trade and so on in the past. But there are a lot of very good academic papers which treat them also in terms of symbols of power, how the Romans would have used them, not just for practical purposes, but to illustrate their power over the people and the landscape of which they had uh, taken. Um, and so here again, you've got another elite. You've got the, the British elite um, starting to put their mark on landscapes. Um, so it's not a Roman road, but if you go to the next slide, in fact, uh, there is a Roman road somewhere um, running under it. So the Earl Bathurst has basically taken, and in a sense is superimposing his power, his landscape power, on an old Roman landscape of power. So it's not one of the main Roman roads, and it's difficult. I'm having trouble interpreting that. There are some ditches and banks about the place that the Roman road should be, according to um, uh, some maps from Gloucester City Council and others. Um, but it's not easy to interpret those um, to an extent they really represent um, some Roman feature that then got incorporated into the map. I, I suspect that um, is not the Roman road there exactly. Next one, please. And then finally, in terms of looking at the sort of that, the, the Roman Iron Age period, is looking at the Bagendon, Bagendon, however you'd like to say it, Opidum, which is, an Opidum uh, was a term used by Caesar for sort of centers of power. So settlements that he came across, uh, major settlements in Gaul and then in Britain. Um, and this is an artistic, obviously, interpretation of what Bagendon might have looked like under the Dobuni, the, the tribe that were uh, the central tribe of this area. Um, and you know, there have been many time attempts to try and interpret what was going on here. One of the things that did take place was coin making, smithying, other activities. 
Um, but recent work by Tom Moore and others has suggested that it was actually quite seasonal. There was only a small population here for the whole year, but it would be a, a central place that people would come to, to exchange goods, to meet, to celebrate. You know, it's very difficult to know because, of course, there are no written records. So there is a certain amount of surmise in all this. But you can see the massive earth banks and ditches. Um, originally, early on in the 19th, uh, the 19th century and early 20th century, people interpreted them as defensive, but they're not contiguous. Um, so it's moved away from what I've labeled there as a fortress mentality um, to a sort of psychogeography. Uh, more and others see it much more about channeling people and channeling livestock. So it's about bringing people in and expressing power, the power and the resources to build these massive ditches. Um, but they're not there for any real defensive purpose. They could have an element of that, but essentially they're seen more as a bit like Stonehenge and other things, dramatic displays of power uh, and perhaps of, of celebrating certain types of spiritual messages. The coin there um, is one of the coins from the Dobani uh, people, and it has a three-tailed horse. And the other thing that Moore suggests is that actually this is more about channeling people for celebratory central meetings and so on, but also horses and other livestock. And there's some suggestion that there was a lot of trading across towards the west to Wales and so on of horses through this particular central place. So again, next slide please. Again, we can start to use LIDAR again to investigate this. And in fact, if you look at Moore's book, um, along with a lot of geophysical survey um, and excavation, uh, LIDAR was an important element in sort of understanding the site. So you've got the dikes here, you can sort of see the size. So it's about a kilometre long from the N to S, the north to south of the major Cutham dike. But you can see they're very discontiguous and it is likely that these are much more to do with um, celebrating a certain sense of place and so on. And then the focus of the Iron Age occupation there. But interesting, again, there is a project that's based on this site, looking at the archaeology, but then getting people to understand it in terms of its current land use, working with landowners. I haven't put the site up, but I'm sorry, I could try and get that sent out later. Um, and obviously you've got that massive modern quarry there as well. So, you know, this sort of imagery is a really good way of starting to get people to think about not just the past, but how that gets integrated into a heritage landscape and a landscape that's still a working agricultural landscape. Next slide, please. Two minutes, Peter. I think we're nearly there. <laughs> Next slide, please. Right. The last one I was going to point out here, just because I think it's fascinating, it doesn't really link back to the sort of the, the power in the same way. It's a subtle form of power, um, and that's water power. And there's some really good um, work done on this. If you look at the food and literary landscape, um, by I know Howard Thomas, one of the three authors, um, if they look at, um, oh, goodness, I'm losing the fl floss on the mill, um, the, the book there, and the way in which um, there's, a, there's a playing out of power over who owns water who controls water and so on and that's to do with milling um, but of course there are very a range of other ways in which landowners tenants and others were fighting a subtle uh, battle over um, water and its power um, so here we've got water meadows these are this is at stratton just outside sirencester um, i mean literally the walking distance of, of where i am so uh, it's not very far about half a mile or so go to the next slide please uh, and what's really fascinating is the way in which maps, historic maps like this, do give us some indication. There's a corn mill there, so there is a mill on the on the churn, the river churn that runs through um, Siren Cess. You've got Ermine Street coming in from the side there. So we've got, I think I called it Ermine Way on one of the other maps, I apologize. Um, and you can see that the basic structure there of the meadows, um, the major um, ditches that are cut from the churn out into the meadow areas. And water meadows were there to be flooded with water at certain times of the year to bring on grass growth, to warm up the soil and so on. So it's a very sort of complicated set of um, ditches and dikes and uh, various ways of manipulating the water. Go to the next slide, please. Can you wind it up, Peter, please? Yeah, this, this is literally the end of it. Um, so here we have a, a DTM image showing the, the very detailed nature uh, of water meadows. So it was just thrown in at the end there, just to sort of take a, a step aside from the very historic stuff to think about more modern um, aspects of landscape and how they've changed. So here now we have um, grazing marshes, but the water meadows um, have been lost, but not entirely lost, because we can use that microtopography to investigate them. Next slide, please. 
and that is it. So I think I'll just about hit it on the head if if, if Seppi's timing's perfect. Um, <laughs> so that's the end of the line. Um, I hope you enjoy this rather fun little map. It was great fun to make, just made simply on PowerPoint. Um, but I haven't had a chance to, to talk to the uh, uh, the chap who originated the the, the, the idea. So I'm, I'm in contact, hopefully. <laughs>